This Sunday is known as Epiphany Sunday. It's a Sunday when we have an epiphany or a revelation of who this Christ child really is. And this epiphany is revealed to all by three magi, sometimes called three kings, um, who come from the east. Actually, the Bible never says there were three of them. It says that there were three gifts. So tradition has shaped this story so that there are three. Here they are. And uh, tradition sometimes gives them names as well. And we are also told that they brought in the scriptures frankincense, gold, and myrrh. We see where that comes from in Isaiah, that there was a prophecy that kings shall come from across the world, from far away, and they shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. So these words that were spoken hundreds of years before Jesus' birth in the book of Isaiah are now fulfilled as these kings show up, as these wise men or magi come from the east, perhaps from 400 miles away, a journey of many weeks, perhaps over a month or a month or two, to gather together with others at Jesus' side. Now, because this would have taken some time, we realize that they wouldn't have arrived when all these other folks were arriving, but and tradition also has the, us put them in the same nativity set and the same, same scene as the shepherds, the angel, and all the sheep and animals here. We, we are so grateful for the children who put these together for us, and we're, we're grateful for this story. We're especially for, grateful for this example of gift-giving. It's said that these magi brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These had significant symbolic value. Gold was a gift for a king, an earthly king, perhaps. Frankincense is uh, like incense that you would use in a time of prayer, so it's used to honor God, so it honors the divinity of Jesus. Myrrh is a gift that was not mentioned in Isaiah. It only shows up in the gospel, and it adds a different element and a different meaning because myrrh was a burial ointment, also very valuable, but used for burying the dead in the, in the most sacred Jewish manner. So it was a sign that Jesus would live and thrive and be a great king, but also would give his life for the forgiveness of our sins. All of this is contained in the meaning of these gifts, which are spontaneously brought by these kings. Gifts are like this, aren't they? They are something that we keep with us and which we can think about in the days to come, perhaps you received a gift like this at Christmas or a special meal which you can remember back to. Gifts are something with a sacred quality because whatever happens in our lives, whatever tensions we might experience between us, that gift from a loved one can remain as a sign of pure love, of their thoughtfulness toward us. It stays with us in our room or in our house as a sign and a memory of something that someone has done in concrete terms to show their love. The greatest gift that these wise men brought was themselves showing up, taking this great journey. And the scripture says that before they ever even gave these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they gave their respect. They knelt, the scripture says, and paid homage to this king. Not giving him gifts as equals would give, as some exchange might take place, but rather as the servants to this king. They declared themselves as his servants by kneeling. They gave their own selves. And of course, we know that our time and the gift of ourselves and our love is greater than any physical gift than we, that we can give. We're reminded this morning to think about what gift we might give in this lifetime that we are blessed to live. As we start a new year and we think about the purpose of our lives, this is a wonderful question to meditate on. We're often faced with this question, what is the meaning of our life? What is the purpose of my life? What is my calling? And it's such an abstract thought, it tends to overwhelm us. But what if we thought more like these magi thought? What gift can I give? What gift can I give today that I might reflect on at the end of my life and look back and say, I did give that. 
I get, did give my talent, my creativity, my love unconditionally to someone I care about. I did give my talents, my service to the world, to a neighbor that I cared about or someone I had never met before. I did give that. That is a sacred thought to carry with us through to the end of our lives and beyond. Amen? What gift can we bring to this life while we have time to give it? It reminds me of participation in a class. We might remember when we sat in the classroom and the teacher expected us to participate in some way. That's, of course, because when people participate, things are so much more fun. When some kid raises his hand and says something creative or funny, it adds life to the classroom and to the conversation. And especially, life is added when we ourselves participate and contribute what we have to offer. What gift can we bring? We notice that the conversation and the idea that we share shapes the current of the overall conversation, influences the direction of the collective thoughts in the room, and brings us back to life and engages us. How much more creative and good that conversation is than when we withhold or clam up or out of shyness refrain from giving that gift that we should really give. The classroom becomes colder, becomes a little more boring for everyone. Life is like this. We have something to say, some gift to give. We must give it. At whatever stage in life, let us prayerfully consider what gift shall we give that we are called to share. This is a God's invitation through the Magi. It's also an invitation to continue giving through difficult times. We are reminded in the story of Herod, whom they visited first, that these were troubled times. Herod was a terrible leader. He was a king that was appointed by the Romans to officiate over the Jewish empire. Herod was a local leader. He was himself a member of that Jewish tribe, but he was also um, serving the Romans above all. So he was a puppet king, really. The Magi somewhat mistakenly go to his kingdom thinking that they should find a king, but immediately realizing that they have the wrong man, and they really insult him by saying, where is the king of the Jews? Where is the real one? And Herod must have been justifiably insulted. But he kept his cool and started to play a trick and said, well, go and find him. Follow that star that you've been following and bring back news of exactly where he is so that I can pay him homage. When, of course, he really wanted to destroy the Messiah, the newborn king who would threaten his own kingdom. Though the Magi were surrounded by a circumstance of violence and danger, they didn't turn back and go to the east and run away. They continued and completed their task. They finished giving their gift of homage and the gifts that they carried. They gave the gifts to Jesus and then cleverly went home, it says, by another route so that Herod would not be able to find out where Jesus' location was so that he could not carry out his plan. We may be shaken at times by the circumstances of our world today. This week has been a tumultuous week for us as a nation and as a world. Tensions have risen for us between our region and the Middle East. Many of us come to worship today with thoughts on our minds and news fresh in our, in our eyes from reading the newspapers this morning. We come together as we should to share these feelings, to gather and find comfort, to confess our sins, our missteps, to pray ardently for peace. Amen? It is right and fitting that we be here this morning to worship God, confessing 
We do not know the way to peace. This is why we depend upon you, O God, to guide us as we pray ardently and commit ourselves to do whatever we can to seek your peace and to continue giving the gifts that we have to give. Notice the Magi were not thwarted by the air of danger that they faced, that they encountered. This unexpected turmoil near Jerusalem. Instead, they gave their gifts. And we learn that when the going gets tough, the tough keep giving. We continue to give what we have to give no matter what. This is a reminder to us as individuals and a reminder to us as a church. Remember all that we have to give. In recent months, we've been speaking about asset-based ministry, thinking about who we are and what we have to give as a church. Think of the collective wisdom and the Christian teaching that we have received in these pews over the decades from faithful pastors and lay people who have shared the faith together. Think of how much that's worth for the community around us. Think of all the people who are isolated and alone in the homes around us right now as we speak who would love to have a Christian friend. How can we go to find them and befriend them in Christ's name? May that be our prayer, and may we not give up until we have given that gift. God has a wonderful invitation to an adventure, much like the adventure that those magi entered into at that first Christmas. Let us also complete our mission to give the gifts God calls us to give. This past week, we also received new, other news for our denomination that was quite overwhelming at first, but is, I believe, a word of good news about peacemaking in the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church has had leaders recently, 16 leaders, meet during the holidays to discuss how we might be at peace with those who disagree with us, particularly around the LGBTQ conversations within the denomination. This group has announced just this past Friday that they have come to an agreement. This was an assembly of very different leaders in the church, bishops from around the world and also lay people who are at the very extremes of disagreement around these conversations. But they came to an agreement that we must, in fact, separate, and that the way that it should work is that the traditionalists who belong largely to the Wesley Covenant Association uh, will separate and create their own denomination, leaving churches like ours and many others in the United States and around the world to remain United Methodist, and also to allow us to revise the Book of Discipline and remove any language that we see fit, especially language that discriminates against LGBTQ persons. In other words, we will be free to be who we have always been as a church, to be truly welcoming to all of our neighbors, while those who opt for a much more traditionalist stance will split off and create their own denomination. It was also agreed that funds would be provided for them to do so, as that's an expensive venture, and it was amicably agreed upon. How did we go from this extremely contentious conversation and vote last February at the General Conference to this peacemaking? One key was an unexpected leader who rose from among the ranks of bishops. His name is John Yambasu. I'd like to share with you his image on the screen. Bishop John Yambasu is the bishop of Sierra Leone in Africa. And as of last summer, he decided he would begin bringing opposing parties together. He, of course, represents a more traditionalist view, but he set aside his own opinions for a time to say, let's get together with those who disagree with one another. And he started orchestrating private conversations, quiet, dignified dialogues that helped to make peace within the denomination. And these culminated in the group that we'll see now in the next slide, uh, this, these 16 leaders, bishops from all over the world of varying beliefs and opinions about this subject, to prayerfully consider how we might peaceably create a divide between 
the two sides. And something called a protocol of reconciliation and grace through separation was released on Friday. We will share this as an email in the coming weeks so that you can review this information yourself. The good news is that as of May, we should finally have resolution to this contentious conversation which has strained our denomination for decades. We will be more free to welcome all people. We will be freer to get back to work preaching the gospel, transforming lives in the name of Jesus Christ, focusing on the greater mission that we share. What a blessing. I was struck too that the peacemaker at the head of this conversation was someone from the east and the south, someone from a faraway land, someone we may never have expected to come and offer this gift. He, does, he perhaps doesn't look like what we would think of as a United Methodist coming from the context we come from, but he was this leader from a far-off land who brought a gift and an instinct that we should come together, and if we are to separate, to do so in a Christian and respectful way way. What a gift we have received from his leadership. We're reminded this morning to give these gifts that God calls us to give, peacemaking, respecting one another, as long as we have life to live. In the same spirit, let us give our gifts this year and for the rest of our lives. Let us prayerfully consider what gift God calls us to bring to God's kingdom. Let us this morning receive the gift of God's birth at Christmas, God's gift to us of this meal, the bread and the cup, as Jesus gives himself in body and blood as a gift to us, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ so that we might be forgiven, that we might receive the gift of eternal life. Let us reflect the gifts that we have received, gifts of unconditional love and grace, and let us give them freely until this world is changed to become God's peaceable kingdom. May it be so. Amen. Will you please stand and sing a song called, What Gift Can We Bring? It's a little new to our church. I'd like to sing it through for you one time. I'll sing verse 1, and then if you will join in singing verses 1 through 4. What gift can we bring? What presence, what token, what words can convey it? The joy of this day, when grateful we come, Remembering, rejoicing, what song can we offer in honor and praise? Let's sing together. What gift can we bring? What presents, what token, what words can convey it? The joy of this day, when grateful we come, remembering, rejoicing, what song can we offer in honor and praise? Give thanks for the past, for those who had vision.
we continue in a spirit of prayer. Generous God, we give thanks for every good gift you give, for each breath, for every day of life, family, food, homes, for the beauty of creation, for the gift of your infinite and eternal love. We give thanks for the birth, life, death, and resurrection of your Son, and for your gift to us of everlasting life. For all of this, we give our thanks and praise today and always, O God. We ask that you would help us to show through our generous living that we serve a generous God. Show us, Holy Spirit, what simple gifts we might give or what great differences we can make in the lives of others through simple gestures. Help us in this way to find great meaning in life, purpose through the giving of gifts that you have offered through us. We confess, O oh God, that we often close our hearts to your gifts and to our opportunities to share them. We worry and fear for the world's troubles. Forgive us for our broken ways, for our tendency to wage violence on one another, to choose violence above peace. Teach us to live as the Magi did, giving good and creative gifts even in the midst of our danger and fear. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would guide us as a world, restore peace among the nations, guide our leaders to seek your peace and your will above all. Holy Spirit, guide our church. We pray that these plans that have been conceived of in these conversations among our denominational leaders and laity that have gathered together over these holidays that you would bless these plans and help them to remain peaceful and free of contention. God, we acknowledge that in whatever format we might worship, whether together or separate, we are one body in Jesus Christ. Help us to treat each other accordingly. We thank you for the leadership of bishops around the world and this Bishop John Yambasu, who has shown us the way to speak to each other in the spirit of Christ's peace. Help us to continue to follow in your way, dear Jesus, as we seek your will for your church. Be born into this world, even as it is, dear Christ, so that your forgiveness, love, and mercy may outshine our darkness today and forevermore. May it be so. And now